All right, last talk, what's new in ED airway management? <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about uh, multiple topics. So I'll give you the roadmap and then we'll dive in. Number one, ketamine versus atomidate in uh, patients who are getting it intubated. Uh, is there a better agent? Uh, stylets versus bougies, the use of stylets versus, bu stylets versus bougies and the evidence behind them. We're gonna talk a little bit about difficult airway algorithms. We're gonna talk about some new gizmos and gadgets uh, related to intubation. We're gonna talk about some techniques for improving our surgical airway skills. And then finally, we're gonna end with COVID as we have for, uh, per tradition of this uh, EMA, uh, EMA session. So the first clinical question is, agents for RSI, is ketamine dangerous or is it the safest agent out there? How many are using ketamine for intubation? Routinely, people like it. Okay, we got it. We got a few ketamine folks. Uh, the four four abstracts we're going to talk about. The first two abstracts are observational studies, so we're going to talk uh, talk through those, um, which show that ketamine actually um, doesn't do as well as atomidate. But remember, they're observational, so there's some caveats there. And then abstracts number three and four are looking directly uh, RCTs comparing ketamine versus atomidate. Um, so we'll focus a little bit more of our energy there. So abstracts number one, or two, one and two come from the NEAR registry. The NEAR registry is the National Emergency Airway Registry, uh, and it's, it, it sort of prospectively uh, uh, collects data on our airway, uh, airway management in the emergency department. So this was a Texas group, and what they looked at, they were looking at the association of peri-intubation hypotension with respect to either ketamine or atomidate. And so they took uh, they looked at a bunch of patients who had normal tensive, were normal tensive and were getting intubated, and th they looked at the, sub the cohort who got ketamine, and they looked at the cohorts who got atomidate. Uh, let let's look at the numbers here. The atomidate cohort had 6,000 intubations. The ketamine cohort had 740 intubations, so a much smaller cohort of ketamine folks. And then the, their primary outcome was how many of those patients got hypotensive? It turns out that 18% of the ketamine group had associated hypotension versus 12% of the atomidate group had associated hypotension. Now, these are associations, and it's really important to think about why people were getting ketamine. This wasn't a randomized control trial where everybody, irregardless of how sick they were, were getting ketamine or atomidate. There are probably reasons that people got ketamine instead of atomidate in these patients. And so oftentimes we're choosing ketamine or choosing atomidate for a specific reason. It's unclear that if the sicker patients got ketamine that it would make sense that they were more hypotensive in the, in the study, but we don't have that data. It turns out when they looked back at the data that the ketamine group had increased levels of trauma, increased levels of sepsis, and increased levels of difficult airways, which was probably the reason they used ketamine in the first place. This is not a great head-to-head, -head, um, but just something to think about with that, hey, should we be watching the hemodynamics in ketamine patients? We talked about this also in those EMS studies. Abstract number two was also from the NEAR database, and this was uh, called Atomidate Uses Associated with Less Hypotension than Ketamine for Emergency Department Sepsis Intubations, a NEAR cohort study. So now we're using that same NEAR database, except they fo focused exclusively on patients who had sepsis, and they did the same kind of study. 531 patients who had sepsis, they looked at the ketamine group and the Atomidate group. Almost three quarters of the patients got Atomidate, and their primary outcome was, again, peri-intubation hypotension, what do you think they found? Pretty similar findings. The atomidate group had 50% rate of hypotension versus the ketamine had um, uh, 74%. So this was a sept septic group who like, was high risk and uh, it, it turns out that the ketamine group had more hypotension, but again, it may be that the sicker patients were the ones getting ketamine, so we don't know. So these two first studies are interesting and they tell us, hey, like ketamine isn't, we often think about ketamine as the medication to give to prevent hypotension, right? But these studies, I think what they're telling me is, hey, sometimes when you give ketamine, um, it is high risk. And those patients that are higher risk in my clinical experience are patients that have other medications already on board. Like we've been giving them uh, fentanyl or morphine for some other injury that they have and now you're going to uh, do a procedural sedation with ketamine and then they drop their pressure or have something like that. So when there's other meds on board, that's a high risk situation. If there's another severe illness on board, those are situations to watch their hemodynamics, of course, because even with ketamine, it doesn't mean that you're just bulletproof from hypotension. So let's look at like more direct studies of ketamine versus atomidate. 
Abstract number three and four, look at that. Abstract number three is actually an old study. This came out, I remember we reviewed this when I was a resident. So this was a 2009 study uh, that looked at 650 patients in French uh, pre-hospital EDs, ICUs, who got intubated, um, and they were randomized to getting either Atomidate, 0.3 mg per kg, or ketamine, 2 mg per kg. And then they looked at the primary outcome of a SOFA score at three days. You guys know what the SOFA score is? It's, the seps it's one of the sepsis uh, metrics. So they looked at SOFA scores at three days, which have to do with vital signs. And then their secondary, more, it's a, just a weird primary outcome to have in this study, but their secondary uh, outcomes were mortality and ICU length of stay. What they found was that they were pretty much equal across the board for SOFA scores, ICU stays. But the mortality showed a trend toward benefit in the ketamine group. They had 31% mortality versus 35% mortality in this, in this cohort. But the p-value was 0.36. These weren't statistically significant. So there's nothing more to say other than that atomidate and, and ketamine tended to be pretty equivalent in this head-to-head -head comparison. And that was the only trial that we had for many, many years since 2009, until just recently, January of 2022, this trial came out, abstract number four, Atomidate versus Ketamine for Emergency Endotracheal Intubation, a randomized controlled trial, or a randomized clinical trial. This was done at UT Southwestern. It was a RCT um, that looked at ketamine versus Atomidate in, intub in 800 intubated patients. And they looked at these patients uh, seven day survivals and 30 day survivals. What they found was actually interesting. At seven days, the ketamine group had a higher rate of survival, 85% versus 77% in the atomidate group. So higher seven day survival. However, if you work that survival out to 28 days, looked out to a month, they basically became the same. They were non-statistically significant. So both the Ketised, Ketised trial from 2009 and this trial are essentially saying the same thing that ketamine and atomidate um, are about equivalent when it comes to certain outcome measures like mortality. They did find slightly higher rates of hypotension in the uh, ketamine group, however. So uh, I guess bottom line here is whether you're using ketamine or atomidate, both of them, like we use them because they are more hemodynamically neutral than other medications. Just know that hypotension is still possible and have an extra um, index of suspicion that hypotension could occur, have your saline bag hooked up or whatever you want to do, just be ready for that hypotensive episode in sicker patients and patients that have other meds on board. Even if you're doing a procedural sedation, I can say that from a lot of you know, personal experience as well. But still, I think ketamine is a great drug, Atomidate's a great drug, um, and they seem to be pretty equivalent. So now let's talk about stylets and bougies. Have you ever thought about like, whether like, these stylets work better than not putting in a stylet? I love the stylets, but there's really not been a whole lot of literature around this um, until, until now. So the abstract number five is a, a study that was done in 2021 looking at the effect of the use of an endotracheal tube and stylet versus an endotracheal tube alone on first attempt intubation success. Without doing a randomized controlled trial, do you think it, it was better or worse with the stylet? They, did, they, they actually did better. I mean, you have better... Um, uh, you know, control of your ET tube and stuff. So they had 1,000 patients enrolled in a French ICU at 32 different centers. All of them were done with direct laryngoscopy by ICU uh, docs or anesthesiologists. And their primary outcome, which you'll see in a lot of airway studies, is first pass success. And they found that the rates of first pass, su first pass success with a stylet was 78% versus 71% in not using a stylet. So go stylets. We've been using them. I don't think we're not using stylets, but... This gives you some evidence for, for that practice. The next few studies are actually super interesting. Uh, they're all having to do with the use of bougie as a, like using bougie first without like using it, you know, a lot of us use a bougie as a backup. Hey, if I don't get it with this first pass on the ET tube, uh, like then I'll use a bougie. So the, the authors in abstract number six, this was the BEAM trial. You may have heard of this trial. It was well, a lot, talked about a lot on um, social media. Uh, but this was a trial that was done out of Hennepin County by a airway group over there. They looked at 750 patients, and they basically randomized them to getting a bougie first, like the bougie being the very first thing that you try, versus doing the ET tube first, and if it doesn't work, then go into the bougie. And they looked at the primary outcome of first pass, first pass success. 
and they found that in the bougie first group, the rate of first pass success, which was defined by either the bougie or the ET2 being in the airway, uh, that 96% of the bougie group, bougie first group, was in the airway first, versus 82% in the, um, the ET2 group. Now, obviously there are gonna be some variables here. If you're very, very comfortable, which I'm almost positive the group at Hennepin is, because if you're studying a bougie first technique, probably the residents there and faculty have gotten very facile with using the bougie. And so there's a skill uh, acquisition there, but it seemed that they, they got some benefit there. And then they looked at some subgroups and they actually found that the group that benefited the most in their bougie first approach were, were the patients who were C-spine immobilized there was a 22% difference in the bougie first group versus the um, airway first group. Obese patients, a 21% difference. So they found that bougies um, were most helpful and had the most significant effect in either their obese patients or their C-spine immobilized patients. How many of you folks feel comfortable with the bougie? Yeah, so you know, it, it's a, it, we'll talk about the other two trials as well, but it's a reasonable approach, it's not unreasonable to try bougie, uh, bougie first. Bougies aren't without, and they didn't have adverse events in this one because it seemed like they're, you know, they did a pretty good job, but remember that if you're like jamming a bougie down someone's airway, you can cause, cause trauma, so you know, just be mindful and ju uh, uh, as you typically already are, but that was a bougie first study. And then abstract number seven was called the bougie trial. This was another study. Uh, a randomized controlled trial, 1,100 patients done at 7 EDs and 8 ICUs. And this was actually done by the same uh, group of authors, of the driver group, except they expanded it out to um, other centers, which is great. Now let's see if this, this bougie first sort of technique works at other places. And they found that the bougie first versus the ET2 plus thylet group, um, the numbers of first pass success were actually uh, similar, 81% versus 83%. 81% in the bougie group, 83%. So it may be that the group in Minnesota like, was better at <laughs> doing bougies than some of these other groups. Um, but if, if, if they use that same, the, the definition they used for first pass success in this study was a little different than the first one. Their definition of first pass success in this study was as soon as the ET tube was in. So if you looked at um, the definition of bougie or ET tube in the airway as that definition, their numbers would have been equivalent, 88% versus 88%. It was a, D oh yeah, so it probably, D I, I'd imagine, I think, I think if I remember correctly looking at it, they were using a DL technique for the bougie. Right, and it's smaller bore and um, abstract, uh, the, the, question, the question was, were they doing the bougie uh, blind or were they using a DL to do the bougie? And uh, this was a DL technique. Abstract number eight, routine use of a bougie improves first attempt intubation success in out-of-hospital settings. So now they've extrapolated the findings and they're looking to see, um, does, does, uh, does this work in a pre-hospital setting? This was a prospective observational trial 18 months before and after. They had a period where they weren't using bougie first, and then they had a period where they were using bougie first. And they found that first pass success actually increased from 70% to 77% when they went to the bougie first technique. So uh, again, taking all this evidence together, a bougie first approach, if you're comfortable with it, seems to be a, uh, a reasonable airway approach. I didn't see the subgroup analysis. I only saw that in the first, uh, first study. But, but, it, but it is a really interesting uh, thing. Like I, so the C-spine immobilized patients, and the question was, did any of the other studies look at the subgroups like you know, C-spine or obesity or other subgroups? Um, and I only saw that in the first study. I'd have to go back and tease out those uh, subgroups and the other ones if they were there. But uh, you're, you know, if you talk to some of the folks that were practicing EM years and years ago at these trauma centers, I know our former chair, who was one of the first grads of our program, um, used to describe patients when they would come in in the C collars, that they would go to a crike first, because there was so much concern about neck injury and all this kind of stuff that they would just crike those patients when they needed ET tubes. Pretty aggressive. Uh, and it's good that we've moved, moved on and we have different techniques and some people are using VL as a first line. But it is interesting if you don't have VL at your shop um, that this bougie first sort of technique, maybe with a little less manipulation, that might be, may, might be a helpful thing, but we don't know. It's a subgroup analysis, so there was some association there, but 
uh, probably warrant some further study, particularly in high-risk uh, populations. The next part of this is a really nice thing that I, I think is worth taking your own time to go through and pulling out your own um, sort of takeaways. These are airway algorithms that are presented from two, different, two or three different groups, actually. So abstract, you can see here the next few pages are the ASA difficult airway algorithm. That's the ana uh, anesthesiology uh, society. And then uh, if you move forward a couple pages, you'll see the default strategy for failed RSI in adults. Um, that's actually from uh, the uh, life, life in Litful. I can't remember what, what the whole thing stands for, but it's a, uh, it's a FOMED uh, site, Litful. Uh, life in the fast lane, I think it's called. But they have a really nice sort of algorithm for how to progress through uh, your difficult, difficult airways. I, I'm not going to deep dive into all of these algorithms. The reason I'm not going to deep dive is I know that every single person in this room has their own sort of like algorithmic approach to an airway. I, I don't want to say there's a best approach, but I think that it is pretty clear that just like a pilot is about to take off and how they uh, navigate a plane, having some form of a checklist manifesto for your airway is critical. And doing that same approach every single time. For me, my approach may not work for some other person's approach. I have a, my approach is the, the three things that I do before an airway, the three things I do during an airway, and the three things I do after the airway. And the three things I do before an airway have to do with oxygenation and ventilation. I make sure I have a BVM and a NPA, OPA. I have an oxygen mask, and I have my RSI meds ready. That's like my pre. And then during, I think about the things I have in my hand. I think about my uh, laryngoscope, I think about my ET tube, and I think about my suction, and I want to mentally know that all three things are there. And then after the intubation, I think about the three things I want after, which have to do with confirmation of the airway. So do I have my end tidal CO2? Uh, do I, and then I also want to make sure that uh, I'm thinking about the other, that I have post-intubation post RSI uh, things on board, and then that I have a securing device. So in my head, all those three things. And then when I go to the computer, I have three orders that I put in every time. It's the vent settings and the chest x-ray and the AVG. So I, I, I say that to say I know that everybody has like kind of a clever different way that they think about airways. But let's talk about some of the essential components that have come out of these studies, um, but without going point by point into every single algorithm. Abstract number nine, or it's not an abstract, I guess, but it's the ASA, the anesthesiology thing. Some of the key points here are that we should always, before intubating somebody or doing a procedural sedation, evaluate. And I know in our shop, if you don't check their malum potty, you're not thinking about their ASA score, that you get dinged on your procedural sedation. But taking that one moment to just go and see, like, do they have a neck? You know, is there, if a worst case scenario is how hard of a crike is this going to be? Um, how much can they open their mouth? Or, or do they have rheumatoid arthritis and is their neck kind of like hunched all the way forward, those really difficult airways? But taking some time, looking at their malum potty, looking at like difficult anatomical features. So, um, and finding the cricothyroid membrane, I think, is a, is a good part of that. Uh, and then preparing. For me, there's the mental preparation and then there's the physical preparation. So mentally preparing, especially when you see difficult elements of the airway, um, they, they discuss like pre preparing mentally for having the backup and the crike, um, but also thinking about positioning and the ramp position, uh, pre-oxygenating, suction, RSI, all the ways that you prepare, like I just described my preparation, the way that you prepare, having all that done first, and then acting. And I, one of my favorite quotes um, out there, and I think applies to emergency medicine often, is everybody, the Mike Tyson quote, you guys have probably heard this, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's a, like a pretty commonly cited quote in emergency medicine. Um, and so you're doing just fine until that person spews out like two liters of blood um, onto the wall or whatever it, whatever it is. So before those things happen that we don't anticipate, have a plan A, B, and C already in place. Um, and then anticipate what you're going to do if plan A, B, and C don't work. Like how are you going to go back? And so one of the things that they talk about both in abstract 9 and abstract 10 is making sure that you have a LMA or some sort of superglottic device ready to go um, or that you have your crike stuff like ready to go just in case. Like worst case scenarios, what are we going to do? Um, we don't, we're not going to talk about it in this uh, abstract. It's not described in this abstract. But how many of you guys are using the uh, eye gel LMAs? Have you guys seen those? 
Yeah, they're pretty neat. I, we've seen them in sort of pre-hospital settings, but the LMAs are so great when you get into a pinch and you can like just float them down there and um, get the patient oxygenated and ventilated. The iGel LMA, one of the, what's the most annoying part of an LMA? Um, you have to like inflate it a little bit, you gotta lube it up and you gotta like get it in there, right? The iGels actually are like, they're full of gel, so they're, uh, the form just stays, the mold just stays and you can get them down there and then after you get it in there, they actually have a uh, intubate, uh, not an intubating, a um, gastric port. So rather than having to get it like an NG tube or anything down there, you could just get the little uh, uh, suction down there and you can get all that air that you're pushing into the stomach out um, before then trying on, moving on and trying your intubation technique. All right, so abstract number 10 was, so, so that was, that, that was the, the just sort of a summary of abstract nine. Abstract 10 what, is a Swiss, Swiss, <laughs> Swiss anesthesiologist who's discuss, discussing difficult airways and predictors of difficult airways. What are those predictors? The location, the ED and the ICU, we have a 35 time increase in adverse events in the ED compared to the OR setting. In the ICU, 55 times increase of adverse events in the ICU setting. Pretty interesting. Obesity, uh, that causes a two times rate of airway complications. And then there's the anatomy and you know, low oxygen reserves and all those things. And then finally, he talks, the uh, author talks about airway adjuncts to consider, which we just talked about. BVM, NPA, OPA, supraglottic devices, thinking about awake intubation and really high risk patients. Patients you don't want to paralyze, that you want to try an awake look, um, which takes a whole skill set. I would urge anybody who's um, not well read on the awake intubation to get really well read on it. Uh, and then I, th this is not available at every shop, but another skill set that, that would be really good to get um, uh, adept at is using the either fiber optic or the you know those like nasal scopes or oral scopes with the camera if you have those available at your shop it's really worthwhile in like you know your angioedema patients or your um, really sick obese COPD patient who you don't want to lay down and paralyze those are sort of some techniques to uh, that we could use all right so some really good stuff in there take your time uh, look through those algorithms uh, if you have a checklist that you're really comfortable with, make sure you like go through that checklist on your own. If you don't have a checklist, take some time and create a little algorithmic approach for yourself. Next big uh, section, gizmos and gadgets. Are there new gizmos or gadgets to know about in airway management? Um, abstracts number 11, 12, and 13. Okay, abstract number 11, I just I frankly don't understand that well. It's abstract number 11 is an intubating catheter. It's called the FROVA device. You'll see the picture of it right there. It basically is like an intubating bougie. It's a bougie with a little port at the end where you can oxygenate through. Um, okay, so what they looked, the, the, the reason I don't understand this that well is once you have a bougie, like why not just put in the ET tube right after? Why do we need a bougie with like a little port to give them oxygen in? I don't know. Maybe in someone who's like a little bit sicker and has really low O2 reserves, this might be a cool adjunct, but um, anyway, this uh, Turkish group was an anesthesia group. They had a randomized control trial, about 50 patients. They looked at first pass success as a primary outcome using the FROVA intubating catheter versus using vid video laryngoscopy, and they found that first pass success was higher in using the intubating catheter. So basically, a bougie first technique um, was better for them than using the VL. Um, it's an interesting little device. I don't, I don't know even if I had it available for me how often I would be using this. I would just probably go just a typical bougie. And that would have been fantastic during COVID times. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, interesting. Right, if, especially if you're able to get the bougie in really, really quickly and oxygenate them and somehow block the seal from COVID. We'll, we'll talk about COVID as well. Um, all right, abstracts number 12 and abstracts number 13 both have to do with uh, video laryngoscopy. And they specifically are looking at the standard geometry video lar laryngoscopy blades that are very much like our DL blades that are used like DL versus the hyperangulated blades that uh, are available that have that really um, exaggerated curvature and you have to really curve your ET tube to fit it. So abstract number 12, again, is the group out of Minnesota. These guys are pumping out like really great airway research. This is the driver group. 
And they used the NEAR registry, and they looked at prospectively collective observational data, and they looked at 12,000 patients who got either the standard geometry VL versus the hyperangulated VL, and they looked at first pack success in those two groups. And what they found was in standard geometry group, about, there were about 7,500 patients in that group. In the hyperangulated group, there were about 4,500. So uh, sort of a 60-40 split in the standard geometry versus hyperangulated. And they looked at first pass success. And actually, the patients did pretty well in both groups, about 90%. It was 92% in the standard geometry group versus 89% in the hyperangulated group. What this is telling me uh, you, do you remember the first time you used the hyperangulated VL? How unnatural was that? Like that was, I think it was a skill set that ED docs just were not accustomed to. I remember doing my first one and like not being able to get it, get the curvature right or any of that stuff. And um, I had a junior res a, a resident who was junior to me who had done them before, and that and I asked that person, I was like, "Hey, you've done these before? Do it." And you know, he got it in no time. Um, but I think it's a skill set to develop. And it seems like that EP, emergency providers have developed that skill set over time, which having 90% success in both of these groups demonstrates to me that ED docs are doing an awesome job intubating and they're doing an awesome job intubating with VL regardless of whether it's the standard geometry or the hyperangulated. If you're not comfortable with either of those techniques, um, start playing around with them in your, in your shops. Um, Anyway, that's, uh, it, you, you can see a little bit on, the, um, on that chart there of how your approach might be different for a direct laryngoscopy versus VL. One of the most important concepts for VL that is highlighted here, but it's not so explicit, is that when we get the VL in, that you don't want to get the VL all the way in like you are your DL. You want to get it to the point where you're seeing sort of half of the arytenoids and you're seeing half of the cords. Um, you don't want to see the whole view. You want to see half the view. That way you get a little bit of room to get the ET tube in the right way. Versus the DL, you want to get all the way in there and get that nice full view. And it's show, showing you that in, this, uh, in these uh, illustrations. There's some really nice videos online as well if um, you want to sp uh, spruce up your VL skills. All right. Abstract number 13 is the, la uh, the last uh, paper that we're going to be looking at on VL. It, and it looks specifically at, you, you had mentioned before, spinal immobilization. So this was a Singapore study of anesthesiologists looking at standard geometry versus hyperangulated patients in, in C-spine immobilized patients. And they randomized 200 patients to each group, and they looked at first-pass success again. And they found that the standard geometry group had a 79% rate of first-pass success versus hyperangulated had 71%. So again, so much of this is dependent on which technique you're, um, you're familiar with and better with. So there's an absolute difference of 8%, but statistically there was no difference between the two groups. Um, the hyperangulated gave better views, but there were longer times to intubation, probably because of some of the techniques associated with having that really hyperangulated curve of the ET tube. All right, let's move on to surgical airways. Um, hopefully you don't have to do too many of these in your career. That being said, you should be prepared to do them on every single um, case because you don't want to be surprised with the, oh gosh, I'm doing a surgical airway. Mentally prep for that surgical airway beha be beforehand. Have any of you been on um, Rich Levitan's Airway Cam um, website? It is a great website. So Rich Levitan um, developed, the, uh, developed or has described this technique of the laryngeal handshake. And this is a cricothyrotomy technique where rather than just cutting and trying to put the, uh, the, uh, the airway in, putting the tube in, putting the shiley in, he talks about how important it is to stabilize that larynx. So with one hand, we're stabilizing the larynx, like gathering, getting good control of it, and with one finger, identifying where that cricothyroid membrane is with one hand, and then with the other hand, you're doing all of your procedural work. You're doing your scalpel, you're putting in you know, you're dissecting and you're either using the bougie technique or your uh, shyly technique, whatever you, whatever you do. And so this, this next question and this next study is very interesting in that they, ta they ask the question of what is the best technique for doing this laryngeal handshake? And they describe two different types of laryngeal handshakes. One, which is the conventional, where we go from the top down to try to identify the cricothyroid membrane. And the other technique being that we start at the sternal notch and work our way up to find the cricothyroid membrane. 
So this was a, a really interesting study. This was done by a group of uh, Korean anesthesiologists. Small study, they, it was an RCT of about 200 patients, and they only enrolled non-obese females. Now why would that be? Well, because in males, it is so much easier to find the cricothyroid membrane, probably regardless of technique that you use. If you go top down or bottom up, you're, you're probably likely to find that cricothyroid membrane. So your, uh, it, uh, the effect of changing your techniques might not matter at all, but they chose to enroll um, non-obese females where the technique might matter, where it's harder to identify the cricothyroid. And so they looked at this sort of like um, the upward, like going, um, the upward, starting at the sternal notch, going up until you identify the, um, the thyroid lamina and you find the cricothyroid membrane versus starting at the hyoid and coming down. And what they actually found, and I got to, I mean, I got to do this on like cadaver models or something to, make, <laughs> to kind of like replicate their findings. They, they found that the cricothyroid membrane was accurately identified using the sternal notch up technique in 84% of patients versus only 54% of patients using the conventional laryngeal handshake kind of going from the hyoid down. Very interesting. Doesn't, you know, take a whole lot. But, uh, you know, as you're assessing your patients for potential airways, start trying this out and, and see if that, that works for you. Are you able to find that cricothyroid membrane and does it make a difference for you when you're doing your laryngeal handshake and going up and down? Non-obese? I, be, again, because obese patients, so the question was, why did they do non-obese? And so in obese patients, it may be that the anatomy is so difficult to find that, I, I agree, I'm, you, I would take it up with the Korean authors that, <laughs> that did this, but they, I agree with you. I, I think that regardless, it's probably worth trying, and I've, I've had my fair share of issues. I know my first, uh, my first really bad crike um, in, in the community was on a morbidly obese CHF patient um, who had just gotten extubated for like the second time in, during their hospital stay. And when I went up there, I was just completely lost in the anatomy. I mean, there was nothing that I could feel. And I found a spot that felt like a membrane and I remember cutting through. And one of the most important concepts for the surgical airway is, and why it's so important to find that cricothyroid membrane instead of the tracheal membranes, is the cricothyroid membrane, there's a, uh, they call it the, um, the, uh, the cartilaginous cage. So even if you took a sta scalpel and just stabbed straight back from the cricothyroid membrane, behind it you're protected by the wall of the cartilage and you can't poke through that unless you're, you know, you're really working to do it. But if you go one level down and you get into the tracheal rings, there is no posterior protection. And if you just cut through that, it is so easy to go posterior. And that's what I did with that patient. I wasn't at the cricothyroid membrane, I cut, and I was able to like push the, the um, shyly through, but when we started to bag, we started to get a ton of subcutaneous emphysema. Why? Because I was, the shyly had gone through that posterior ring and was really starting to expand in all the wrong places. So um, finding that cricothyroid membrane is critical um, and a skill set that is really worth uh, doing. And so since that case, I've been very mindful and very intentional about being like trying to make sure that I 100% am feeling that cricothyroid membrane. But it is very difficult in obese patients. And if somebody could describe a technique for obese patients, that would be wonderful. But, um, but you know, if you go too high, you're in the hyoid. If you go too low, you're in the trachea. Both are bad. All right, last uh, topic is COVID airways and best practices. I know that many of us uh, have been in the setting of having to intubate somebody uh, who is very high risk and going through all the proper protocols. This is a reminder of the best practices of those protocols. Number one, before preparation, protect self. I remember how many times we had cardiac arrests where everybody would run in, but nobody was gowned or masked, like, because just that's how we are as e emergency providers. Patient sick, run toward the patient and, get, uh, and save, that, save that life the best we can. But in this case, it, it, the practice is really protect self, make sure your PPE, PAP, or whatever is on before you get in there. And then in the pre-oxygenation phase, um, they talk about making sure that we use a non-rebreather face mask with a good seal and even a mask over it if possible. Um, avoid apneic oxygenation, where you know the technique where you put the nasal cannula in the nose and then you like stick the non-rebreather over. That breaks the seal and hasn't really been 
shown to be that much uh, improved. So avoiding that. And then using non-invasive pressure ventilation, avoiding that as much as possible. But if it is needed, making sure you have a good seal. And then one of the interesting things, did you guys ever see these uh, intubating boxes that people were uh, starting to talk about? Um, they have not been shown to work. They, I know they've, they um, studied it at our shop as well, and the findings are probably going to get published soon, but not a whole lot of utility in using those, and if anything, it complicates the airway more. And then um, if you're going to crike, their recommendation is that you cut and then use the, the bougie technique, where as soon as you cut and you've gotten through the cricothyroid, get the bougie in there um, to uh, get into that space and then uh, do the crike that way. 